Mr. Dyson here, ready to finish out Unit 5 on Work and Energy with Lesson 3. So in this lesson now, we're going to introduce the idea of springs. Okay, We've talked about springs in general physics, and we talked about how every spring has a constant K, which is called the spring constant, which is basically a measurement of the stiffness of the spring. So the larger the K value is means the harder it is to stretch or to compress this spring. Hooke's law allows us to determine the amount of force necessary to compress a spring or to stretch a spring away from its equilibrium position. The position that it naturally wants to be in, if you just leave it alone, is its equilibrium position. And therefore, x is used to represent the distance away from that position that you stretch or compress the spring. The force is always a restorative force, which is what the negative sign is for in Hooke's law, showing that if you compress the spring inward, that the force is going to be pushing outward, or if you stretch the spring outward, that the force is going to be pulling inward. It's always going to be the opposite direction to whatever you do. So all we have to do is multiply k times x, the, the distance that the spring is being moved, and that will tell us the force that is being exerted by the spring. Now, in addition to this, we want to also think about the elastic potential energy in a spring. When you stretch a spring, when you compress a spring, you are putting energy into it. So you're using your energy and you're transferring it into the spring. So now there's a certain amount of potential energy in the spring, which can be converted into kinetic energy by allowing the spring to move and go back to its original equilibrium position. The amount of potential energy stored in a spring in this way is equal to the potential energy of the spring, one-half kx squared. Notice how similar it is to our um, kinetic energy rule, one-half mv squared. So potential energy, one-half kx squared. The work energy theorem when we get involved with a spring is this. Um, again, remember that if energy is lost, that uh, the amount of work that's been done on the system is going to equal the change in the energy of the system. Except in this case now, we have to begin to include the potential energy of springs. So we have two types of potential energy. We have the potential energy of gravity, and now we have the potential energy of a spring. Now these three can all be present in a single problem. Often only two of them are kinetic energy and gravity or kinetic energy in the spring. You know, we'll see, we'll do problems like that. But they can, all three of them, be involved in one problem. Um, so at this point we have to just distinguish between the two types of potential energy, gravity and spring. And they're going to just use PE without any letter to represent the combination of those two types of potential energy, the total potential energy in the system. So the potential energy of the spring is added to both sides of the conservation of energy, and now we see the conservation of energy equation. Okay, This is the full equation for conservation of energy. Notice that the left side is just all the initial energy, and the right side is all the final energy. And if you have all conservative forces acting in the problem and no energy is being lost, then you'll have conservation. The amount of energy at the beginning must equal the amount of energy at the end, even though some energies may turn into other types of energies like kinetic energy being turned into potential energy, and vice versa. When non-conservative forces are present, the total mechanical energy is not going to be constant, as we just said. So there's a, work is going to be done by the non-conservative forces, for instance, friction, and the amount of work that friction does can be calculated basically in this way. The work done, this little NC is for non-conservative forces. So think about it like the work done by friction. How much work is being done by friction in a problem? It's the change in the kinetic energy plus the change in the total potential energy. So you're looking for the final kinetic energy minus the initial kinetic energy and the final potential energy minus the initial potential energy. And whatever that adds up to, whatever that difference is, that's how much work had to have been done by friction. All right, whatever, whatever loss, total loss of energy there is in the system, that was the work done by friction. It's, it's what took the energy out. All right, so as an example here, we have a block attached to a horizontal spring. We have the constant of the spring given as 400 newton meters, or newtons per meter. The surface of the block rests upon a frictionless surface, so we're not going to worry about friction in this case. Um, 
if the block is pulled out by 0.05 meters, all right, so there's its displacement, 0.05 meters, we want to A, find the speed of the block when it first reaches the equilibrium point. So uh, it's being pulled away from equilibrium by 0.05 meters and let go. At that point, it has all potential energy. It's not moving, but there is energy now in the spring. And then it gets let go, and it returns to equilibrium, and it, the potential energy in the spring now gets transferred to the block as kinetic energy, so that by the time the block reaches the equilibrium position where it started, it's going to have a certain amount of, of kinetic energy. So this is a transference of energy. It's a, I'm sorry, a conversion of energy from potential energy of elasticity becoming kinetic energy. So filling in the numbers, 1 half kx squared tells us how much potential energy the spring has to begin with, and all of that gets transferred into, converted into kinetic energy, 1 half mv squared over here on this side. And so what we're trying to find simply is the velocity uh, of the spring at that point in time. So solving through here for v. Okay, in part b, we're now asked to find the speed when x is equal to 0.025. This is kind of like the diver. If you think back to the diver on the diving board, here they're asking you, when they asked you, uh, what's the velocity of the diver when he's halfway down, when he hasn't hit the water yet? Here they're kind of saying, well, what's the velocity going to be of the block when it's halfway to its equilibrium point? Because 0.025 is half of 0.05. So in that case, there's a mixture. There's a mixture of potential energy and kinetic energy. Right? All the potential energy has not become kinetic energy. Part of it has. But we're simply going to use the kinetic, the conservation of energy theorem. Kinetic energy initial plus potential energy of elasticity initial equals kinetic energy final plus potential energy of elasticity final. Notice potential energy of gravity does not appear in this problem. Okay, There's no gravitational change. The level of the block does not change. It stays at the same vertical level for the entire problem. So gravity, potential energy, does doesn't come into this problem. I mean, I, I could write it at first if I wanted to be thorough, but the first thing I would do after I wrote it would be get rid of it because it's a zero. So here we have zero initial kinetic energy plus one half uh, kx squared. All right, that's the formula for the potential energy initial of elasticity. And then on the other side, it's going to equal one half times five v squared, right, the kinetic energy of the uh, block final plus the final potential energy of elasticity of the block. Okay, so that's just uh, fill in the numbers and solving here through for V gives us 0.387 meters per second. And then the final question that they ask us in part C, um, repeat part A if friction acts on the block and the coefficient of friction is 0 0.150. All right, now we have to consider um, the friction, which is going to take energy away from the system, right? So the potential energy of elasticity initial, which is what the block has, minus the work done by friction is going to equal the kinetic energy of the block final, okay? Um, so again, this is set up from that initial uh, equation that I showed you a few slides back where you can find the work done by non-conservative forces, which is equal to the change in, uh, in the energy of the system. So using that idea, the potential energy that I have to start with, take away the work done by friction, that's what's going to be left for, uh, for kinetic energy in the block. So the initial potential energy of elasticity is given as 1 half kx squared minus the work done by friction, Okay, so now the work done by friction, remember, is equal to the force of friction, which is mu, the coefficient of friction, times the normal force. So here's the normal force, mg, because we're on a flat surface. So the normal force is the same as the weight of the block. So there's mg. And over here, this is the distance that the block travels. So the work done by friction is given here. And that becomes out, it comes out to 0.3675. Over on the other side, we have the kinetic energy of the block, uh, and we're going to solve through for V. All right, I'll ask you to go through and try this one. In this case, there's an initial velocity, so there's an initial kinetic energy. It's not just all potential energy to begin with, but you're still going to use the conservation of energy to solve, as in the previous example. 
Example 10, we have a 50 kilogram circus acrobat dropping from a height of two meters onto a springboard. Okay, that's just a, imagine it as a gigantic spring. And the springboard's spring constant is 8,000 newtons per meter. Um, by what maximum distance does she compress the spring? So imagine the person falling, right? They're going to have uh, the person jumping from a height and then falling on a spring, gigantic spring at the bottom. Woo! So the person falls on the spring, and you, you know the spring's going to get squished. So that means that whatever energy the person had at the top, the potential energy, that's all potential energy to start with. It gets converted into kinetic energy. So potential energy of gravity on the way down gets converted into kinetic energy. By the time she hits the spring, now she starts to squish the spring, and all the kinetic energy that gets turned into potential energy of elasticity. The question is, how far will the spring get squished? So that all the kinetic energy can get transferred into potential energy of elasticity. There's a slight little glitch here that you probably wouldn't think of, so let me take you through it. Here the potential energy of gravity is converted to potential energy of elasticity. It first gets converted to kinetic energy, as I just said, but all the kinetic energy then becomes potential energy of elasticity. So we don't need to actually calculate the kinetic energy. We do, however, have to include the small distance the spring is compressed, x, as part of the distance the person falls. So that little, as soon as the person hits the spring, they have all the kinetic energy, but then they start to squish the spring. But in squishing the spring, remember, they're still moving downward. So there's this little tiny distance from where they hit the spring down to where they, you know, wherever the spring stops being compressed. This little teeny weeny distance we'll call x, which actually counts as part of the distance that they move. So we're going to have to include that in our formula or in our equation. So here we have the potential energy of gravity at the top before they jump, all right, mgh. And um, I've included here uh, x in the potential energy. Because remember, okay, so they, they fall, was it two meters? Sorry, yeah, two meters. They fall two meters, but they don't just fall two meters. They actually fall two meters plus that little tiny distance that they squished the spring down. So what we're saying is that to, con to calculate the potential energy, we're considering the zero level to be right here at the bottom, right? There's our zero level. So here's the two meters. From here to here is two meters to when they hit the spring. And then plus that little tiny distance that they squished the spring. So we're saying right at the bottom of that, when the spring actually stops, where the spring actually stops being squished, that's our zero level for calculating the potential energy. So that's why I've calculated potential energy as mg times 2 plus x, because 2 plus x is the distance above the zero level for using to calculate potential energy. Over on the other side, potential energy of elasticity, 1 half k x squared is the formula. Notice again, I completely skipped over kinetic energy, because the potential energy gets connected, the gravity gets converted to kinetic energy, but then the kinetic energy all gets changed into potential energy of elasticity. So this is the before, the initial, and this is the final. And I just completely skipped over the kinetic energy part. Solving through then here for x gives us x equals 0.56 meters. Okay, in this example, I take it and it's pretty much exactly the same as the previous problem. All right, example 11. Now we have a spring block system, a block connected to a spring, and we have an incline. So here, um, we want to find the maximum distance d that the block travels up the frictionless incline, and the angle is 30 degrees. So now, in this case, something to notice. We're going to be looking for this distance d. But in calculating potential energy, Remember, you only want the distance above the zero level. So the ground is going to be considered our zero level. And so basically when the block stops up here, h is the height above the ground that the block ends up. So we're going to have to use a little bit of trigonometry, uh, but we're interested in it. We're going to be using this h, okay? So in this case, all the initial potential energy, which is in the spring, gets converted into potential energy of gravitation. Again, 
First, it becomes kinetic energy. The block starts moving. It, it gets let go. It starts flying here, and then it hits the incline. And so all the potential energy of the spring got turned into kinetic energy, which is making the block move. Now the block starts up the incline. And as it goes up the incline, it slows down because its kinetic energy is getting turned into potential energy. So the initial part is all potential energy in the spring. The final is all potential energy of gravity. And again, we're going to skip over the middle part, which is when it turns into kinetic energy, because we're not interested in answering a question about that part. We're just interested in the beginning and the very end when it's at the top of the ramp. So potential energy of elasticity initial must equal potential energy of gravity final. All right, then filling in the numbers and using H here, we find out that the maximum height to which it rises is 0.638. So we just found, using this, we found that H was 0.638. But they want to know the distance d that it travels up the incline. In other words, they want to know this distance. That's simply a trigonometry issue. So here I said, using trigonometry, the sine of the 30 degree angle equals opposite over hypotenuse. The sine of 30 is equal to opposite over hypotenuse. So the opposite is h. The hypotenuse is d. We know h, so I just filled in the number, and I used this to find d. Part b, how fast is a block going when it's halfway to its maximum height. All right, so halfway again. Now again, there's a mixture of energies. So there's going to be some kinetic energy, because when it's halfway up, it's still moving. And there's going to be some potential energy. So the kinetic energy of the block plus the potential energy of the block at this point must equal the initial energy of elasticity that was in the block to begin with. So here we have it. The potential energy of elasticity the block had to start with equals the potential energy of gravity final plus the kinetic energy final. So here we know to begin with it was 3.125. We found that out up here. And uh, the potential energy of gravity final is going to be 0 0.5 times 9.8 times 0.319. That's mgh, right? Now, I already figured out at the beginning of the problem, when it's halfway up the ramp, it's going to be half the height. We found h uh, in the previous problem was 0.638. So I'm just saying half of that now is 0.319, and that's what I'm using for h in calculating the potential energy of gravity. And then the kinetic energy of the block, 1 half times its mass times v squared, and v is what we're looking for in this problem. Solve through to find v is 2.5 meters per second. Okay, you can try this problem on your own. Lastly, we come to uh, just one little thing before we leave work and energy, and that's the concept of power. Remember, the amount of work you do has nothing to do with time. So if I were to lift a chair up in the air, lift a chair up in the air, that's my chair. If I lift the chair up in the air, I don't care, and I don't know where I put the chair. If I lift it up three meters in the air, right? So um, in order to determine the work that I do on the chair, I need to know the weight of the chair, because that's how much force I have to use, and I need to know the distance I raise the chair in the air. So I would simply take the weight of the chair times three meters, and that would tell me the work I did. But I could raise that chair, those three meters, I could do it in, in five seconds, or I could take 10 years to do it. You know, it doesn't, it's nothing to do with time. Work doesn't have anything to do with time. But when we get time involved and we talk about, all right, now let's talk about how quickly I'm going to do the work. The rate at which we do work, that's what power is. The rate of energy transfer. So power is equal to work divided by the change in time. And the units of power are the watt. A watt is a joule per second. So remember, work is measured with joules. Obviously, time is measured in seconds. So a watt is a joule per second. How much energy are you doing over a given period of time? Um, we think of power as people's strength. So you know, if you had a very, very heavy chair, or there was somebody sitting in a chair, you know, obviously it's going to take a lot of work energy to lift that person in the chair. Now, a weak person might be able to do it, but it's going to take some strain. It's going to take some time for them to get that person up in the air. 
uh, a stronger person will be able to lift it more quickly. Um, so that's the concept of power, how quickly you're able to do work. So um, we do have to know, because sometimes you run into this in problems, they do use the standard customer units that we use in America. And so what we use is called the horsepower. All right, you've probably heard the term horsepower. A horsepower is equal to 746 watts of, of uh, power. So you can use that uh, if you need to in, in problems for a conversion factor. All right, so in this example, we have uh, killer whales. And basically, uh, the question comes down to this. Calculate the average power that a killer whale uh, that has a mass of 8,000 kilograms would need to generate to reach a speed of 12 meters per second in six seconds. Okay, so notice with power, there's always going to be time involved. So the first question is, um, you know, power's work, power is work done divided by the time it takes to do the work. How much work is done? That's going to be the first question. The work done on the whale will equal its change in kinetic energy, since we're ignoring drag force. And again, that's because drag force is friction, which is a non-conservative force. Um, so here, we're not calculating work uh, using our formula, which is force times distance. That's not the only formula we know for work. We also know that we can calculate the work done by the change in an object's kinetic energy. So that's the work kinetic energy theorem. Think about the change in the whale's kinetic energy. So the final kinetic energy of the whale has to do with the whale's velocity. It's one half times the mass of the whale times the velocity squared, one half mv squared. So we're given 8,000 kilograms for the mass of the whale. So one half times 8,000 times 12 squared. The, the whale's final speed in the problem is 12 meters per second. So the final energy of the whale is this, 576,000 joules minus the initial we assume the whale started from rest, so it had no kinetic energy to begin with. So therefore, 576,000 joules of work had to be done on the whale, one way or the other. Now, that's just the work part of it, because power is work divided by time. This work was done, the whale sped itself up to that velocity in six seconds. So all we have to do to figure out the power is take the amount of work done on the whale divided by the time it took to do the work, and we have 96,000 watts for our answer. Okay, that's about as far as I want to go into power. Uh, here's one for you to try. And once you've done that, that's the end of this unit.